and welcome to CG seminar number 136, which is also webinar number four. It's great to see everyone. Um, and today we have a topic of great interest and concern to all of us, international student mobility uh, during and after COVID-19 pandemic. I understand there were 660 registrations for today's webinar and we're already at over 200 participants. Um, until the pandemic took hold, six million students cross borders every year for tertiary education programs of a year or more. The benefits of that global traffic have been immense. I'm not talking about the contribution of international students to the provider countries through their uh, bottom line, though that is a significant factor, of course, when we're calculating the effects of the pandemic. I'm talking about the transformative effects for mobile students themselves, sometimes also for local students, and for both the sending countries and the receiving countries. And above all, international education brings the world together on the basis of deep cooperation and greater understanding. With cross-border traffic severely disrupted, we will increasingly feel the, the loss of these global common goods. To open up this topic, we have three outstanding speakers today in Vivian Stern, Lee Tran, and Brendan Cantwell. Vivian is the Director of Universities UK International. She has had two decades of experience in higher education policy and politics in the UK and abroad. International education has no more clear-minded or more committed advocate than Vivian and we are delighted that she has joined us today. Lee Tran of Vietnam and Australia works in the School of Education at Deakin University and is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Her research, which always brings new things to us, focuses especially on internationalization, including graduate um, employment issues. I've been fortunate to have worked with Lee for more than 10 years on common projects. Brendan Cantwell is at Michigan State University in the United States. He's an immensely productive and insightful scholar who specializes in the political economy of higher education and its role in social order. And along with Jenny Cash and myself, he's an editor in chief of the journal Higher Education. Now, before the webinar starts, let's quickly run through the webinar protocols. Apologies for those who've heard all this before. Now, the webinar is being recorded. The webinar is being recorded and um, will be posted online on the CG website in due course. I hope it's now showing. Um, a transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted. Please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or, or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question. We recommend using speaker view so that you can more clearly see who is talking. You can ask questions during the webinar or at the end of the presentation. There are two ways to get my attention to ask a question. Firstly, you can use the raise hand button found through the participant section. Secondly, you can get my attention or ask a direct question in the chat section. And given that we have over 200 participants, if you put your questions in writing in advance, you are more likely to be asked to come in during the Q&A. Now, when invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video, and state your name and where you are from. Now, our speakers will each speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll take questions and discussion. As I mentioned, feel free to send your questions in writing during the presentation. 
Our speakers will follow the order, Vivian, Lee, and Brendan. And let me now pass the screen to Vivian. Great, thank you very much indeed, Simon. And it's a real pleasure to be part of this webinar. Um, and also to share a, a panel with Lee Tran. We've co-authored something together on graduate employability, but we haven't really met face to face. So isn't the world a wonderful place that we can do this online? Um, the, the topic, it couldn't be a, a more significant one to us. I mean, I'm sure that in other parts of uh, public life all around the world, there are bigger things to worry about than international student flows. But in my world, uh, this is really a, an absolutely burning topic. Uh, what will happen in the coming autumn to international uh, mobility uh, worldwide and to the UK in particular, and uh, beyond this autumn and the, the coming academic year, is the current crisis, the pandemic that we're living through right now, uh, going to result in uh, short-term change only, or will that change be persistent in the medium term, or indeed, as the title of the webinar suggests, is something changing now, uh, which will never go back? Um, I think that's a really important question. It's not only important um, for UK universities for inevitably for financial reasons, but right now that is a major concern. It's also really important because if you think of the way that internationalization of our universities has changed the way we teach and learn and the way that we form uh, educational partnerships and research partnerships with uh, other uh, academic institutions around the world. And um, the fact that we in the UK certainly have had an opportunity to bring people from all four corners of the globe uh, to study together on our campuses and to share what they know with each other, to take part in heated debates, uh, bringing together their very different perspectives. That's become quite significantly uh, characteristic of the UK education system. It is one of the things I think that makes universities in the UK an interesting and exciting place to learn. So if something is changing and it's not gonna go back, it will matter to us uh, much more than in only the respect, the financial respect. We're also uh, going through this crisis in a particular moment in time. And for the UK, I suppose one of the great frustrations is we felt uh, from last autumn onwards that the UK was beginning to get its mojo back. We've spent uh, the last decade, more or less, uh, shooting ourselves in the foot in policy terms, finding new and inventive ways to put international students off coming to the UK through our uh, visa system. And that had all begun to change. Uh, Boris Johnson, you'll have your own views about him as a prime minister, but when it comes to understanding the importance of international connection in education and research, he totally gets it and uh, had made already a really significant difference to the visa regime, both for UK universities in attracting staff, creating a new global talent route, trying to make it easier for people to come to the UK as academic staff, uh, but also introducing something that we've campaigned for for a very long time, a new post-study work uh, opportunity for international students who come to the UK to stay on as graduates for two years. The graduate route, which is going to be implemented in, implemented for um, graduates from summer 2021 onwards. And we'd already seen in the performance of UK universities recruiting internationally uh, the impact of those policy changes. One of the great frustrations is looking at those graphs of growing interest, the, uh, the search behaviour captured by commercial entities like uh, study portals and IDP Connect, which we're uh, logging on a kind of real-time basis on our website, the uh, visa applications that were being lodged, the inquiries to institutions. What we were seeing was a real rebounding of interest in the UK as a study destination after a decade of stagnation. And in fact, just to give that, um, uh, that background a little bit of um, uh, you know, statistical basis, um, the UK, uh, over the last decade, lost uh, market share in 17 of the 21 top uh, sending uh, uh, countries for international mobility. And in 2016, our growth rate was 0.3% compared to about 14% in Australia. Um, overall, we'd lost market share um, in that period of um, uh, the last decade from uh, a position of about 11% of global um, students coming to the UK to about 8% in the last year for which we have figures available. Um, so that, that frustration that we were looking at a recovery, now looking at an autumn in which all bets are off, um, it seems to me that the next couple of 
uh, months are critical. Um, we've seen lots of uh, studies of international student decision making uh, behaviour, the attitudes of prospective students. And I think what we can see from some of the excellent work that organisations like the British Council, and just in case uh, there's anybody from the British Council on this webinar, I just want to pay tribute to Matt Dernian and Jazreel Gogh, who are doing some fantastic work in this area. I think they're just superstars and, and I really thank them for what they've done. And um, they're producing really granular insights into what international students in a variety of places think about the prospects of studying overseas this autumn. And what we can broadly see is a lot of people who are undecided, understandably so. They want to know what the deal is. They want to know if they come to the UK in the autumn, uh, actually, if they go to other destinations too, how will they be taught? Will they be safe? Will the quality and the experience be comparable to what they would have got under normal circumstances? Is it better to wait? Is it better to stay locally? And I think we've got a kind of two month period in which we have to get the uh, foundations uh, in place to make sure that international students are able to come uh, to the UK safely, uh, that we can be uh, reassuring and they can be crucially confident that they will be safe and well looked after uh, while they are with us. Um, and that the quality of the experience that they get, albeit inevitably different um, during the current uh, crisis, uh, will nonetheless be a high quality experience, which enables them to interact with counterparts from around the world, which is, I think, uh, really what our students who come to us want. And we've got to work very hard on that. Um, the question, though, is, is it just about fixing the knitting for the next two months? Is it just about smoothing the path and making sure that students who still want to come can come in the autumn? Uh, my feeling is it probably isn't. I mean, first of all, there are going to be things that get in our way that it will be really hard for universities to do anything about. At the moment, one of my biggest concerns is simply the availability of commercial flights. Uh, if if it, it is difficult for an individual to get a commercial flight at an affordable uh, price to come to the UK, what, uh, what will that do? Uh, we've got all sorts of um, uh, structural issues, for example, around the uh, visa application centres. Fortunately, we're now able to see the green shoots. We're seeing visa application centres starting to reopen around the world and the UK's um, uh, infrastructure springing back into life. And that's, uh, that's, that's very important. Um, but as Simon has argued, actually, in, in other panels that I've been part of, there's the bigger question. We have a current health crisis, but the economic crisis that follows inevitably is going to damage the ability of individuals who otherwise would have studied internationally to follow their dreams. Um, we cannot, I think, predict what the long, the medium and the long term consequences of that will be. We can look, and we've done this um, working with uh, the ever brilliant Janet Lieva in a piece of work that we're going to publish in the next couple of weeks. We've looked back at previous uh, crises, the Asian uh, uh, currency crisis and the, and the SARS epidemic, to look at what it can tell us about the impact on mobility. And I think that in some respects, we can draw some comfort from those that even though you do see an immediate impact on mobility, there is a bounce back and they were different, there were different shapes to that recovery in those two instances, but the recovery came and uh, you know, we've seen sustained growth since that period. I think the economic crisis we're about to experience is unlike anything we've ever known. Um, and there is no precedent in the data for what we're about to live through. Conscious of time, I think what I will um, uh, conclude by saying is that if we're in a period where both in the immediate short term and in, the immediate, and in the medium to longer term, it is more difficult for people who really want to come and participate in our education system to do that. We've got to be more creative about how we get to them. And that takes me back to that sort of educational motive um, alongside the financial motive that universities have. Now, the UK has been pretty good and pretty entrepreneurial when it comes to the delivery of transnational education. Transnational education um, is currently being delivered to about 700,000 students, uh, UK programmes being delivered to about 700,000 students studying um, around the world, not in the UK. And those programmes have created important pathways for people who want to combine some study in the UK with uh, study closer to home. Um, and I believe that as with many other crises, what this crisis will produce is an acceleration of existing trends. 
So growth in UK universities, and I imagine other major um, internationalized university systems taking what they can offer closer to uh, the places where students want to learn. But we're likely to see a growth in intra-regional mobility, as well as the inter-regional mobility, which has characterized um, uh, international education flows in the past. Um, but to end on a positive note, um, I think that the, the demand amongst young people to spend some period of their life studying outside their home country in a major higher education system is likely to remain. Um, I therefore, having been asked several times about whether the government's, our government's uh, target to recruit 600,000 international students by 2030 is now unrealistic, my answer is no. Uh, I think that uh, there will still be demand for people who want to uh, live and study physically alongside uh, counterparts from the UK and all over the world in both UK universities and in the other major internationalized um, systems around the world. Um, and I don't think we should give up on that as a mode of delivery because we benefit from it enormously in both the sense of global, global classrooms, uh, but also of course in the way that we have an opportunity to forge a relationship with individuals, uh, which you can see from alumni data uh, persists in their attitudes right throughout their lives. So I think we'll have to work hard, we'll have to be creative, uh, but I think we shouldn't give up hope that um, the flow of international students uh, to the UK and to elsewhere will continue. Um, I think I probably, in view of time, Simon, better draw my marks to a close there. Thank you. And thank you, Vivian. And I agree with you that over that 2030 timeline, uh, return to flows of the, of the target level is quite realistic. Uh, and I think that the, both the existing countries will retain their attractiveness and the East Asian providers will gain more students as well. We'll see both things happen. Um, we have 300 people, uh, the full complement under our Zoom uh, protocol in the, in the webinar. And we have 16 people when I last looked in the waiting room. I apologize to those who are unable to get in, but as people drop out, which happens during an hour, some people will be able to enter. Uh, can I now pass the screen to Lee? Sure. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me to join this panel. And uh, um, Vivian mentioned it is a great opportunity uh, for me to um, re co author before. And um, Vivian has set up the scene beautifully by talking about the benefits of international students to. Um, UK university or to international university in general. So I'm going to look at um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on international student mobility. And um, there are four key points that I would like to mention in my short presentation. Um, firstly, I would like um, to walk you quickly through international student mobility in Australia. And then I will discuss the key factors that negatively affect Australian international education recovery, as well as the factors that are likely to favorably affect Australian international education recovery. And then I will wrap up with um, a brief discussion of the geopolitical tensions that are likely to impact international education in general as well. Um, so looking at the, um, the number of international student visa holders in and outside Australia at um, the end of March 2020, so um, there was almost 695 international students in Australia at the end of March, and 80% um, of them um, was outside Australia. So, and um, among the top five countries, um, almost 40% of our Chinese international students were outside Australia by the end of March. And um, for India, 6% of our Indian students are outside Australia, were outside Australia by that time, that followed by um, the third 
sending country for Australia, which is Nepal. So the majority of our Nepalese students was in Australia by, the, by that time. And uh, Vietnam and Brazil was number four and number five sending country for Australia. And around 13% of Vietnamese and Brazilian students was outside Australia by that time. And um, from my perspective, in addition to the traditional pull and push factors, international student mobility trends post COVID-19 will likely depend on the recovery of the major sending countries. And um, secondly, on the COVID-19 infection loss and the pandemic management in key destination countries. And the third factor that, that is likely to affect um, international student mobility trends post COVID-19 is the length of border and campus closures. And we also argue in a number of um, publications recently is how host country approaches to supporting and treating international students are also likely to affect international student mobility. And um, the responsive of host community to pre assisting racism and new form of COVID-19 racism facing international students are key factors too. The other aspect that may be likely um, affect the recovery is the quality as well as the flexibility of um, education program, especially online program and the online experience offer for international students inside and outside the host country during COVID-19. And the visa extension as well as visa renewal, flexibility and support that host country can offer international students. And um, the final point that, um, that is really critical is the geopolitical tensions um, that um, I'm going to talk um, as well. And for Australia, the, the key factors that um, are likely to impact Australian international education in media as well as um, long-term recovery is how its reputation has been affected by the federal government pol policy, especially how international students and all temporary workers are excluded from the federal government's JobKeeper subsidy and coronavirus supplement. And the focus um, of the federal government on Australians and domestic students first, and the us and them responsive, have triggered a rising tide of racism against international students and Australian students of Asian backgrounds. Um, the phrase of go back to your home country has become quite prominent um, over the past few months as well. And the reports on international student vulnerability and hardship, including job and financial loss, mental health problems, lack of accommodation, food and support networks, as well as um, discrimination. However, there are a number of factors that are likely to favorably affect Australian international education recovery. Um, the first point that I would like to highlight is how the federal government exclusion of international students from JobKeeper and subsidy has triggered more remarkable support, more impressive support from um, the state government as well as institution in Australia as compared to many other destinations. And these include financial hardship grants that are offered by a number of university and state government, provision of intensive courses, free refund and deferral extended academic and welfare support, counseling, special helplines, and also um, remarkably support with visa issues, emergency food relief, accommodation and employment. And we should also mention the support from community organization and the COVID-19 International Student Support and Welfare Hub um, developed by Australia. And also Australia in collaboration with CISA, we did the Council for International Students in Australia, ISANA and IEAA, International Education Association of Australia, together developed resources to support international student welfare and also business support. And the key factor that 
factor that um, is likely to positive, positively impact on Australian international education recovery is how the country has effectively managed COVID-19 at this stage and that, that is likely to lead to better management of international student health, safety and well-being and also earlier international student travel than um, some other countries as well as earlier and safer return to face-to-face -face study and part-time casual work and the strong sense of security of return on investment in study in Australia for, for parents and, and international students if we look at the perception of risk. Um, and um, another, the, another factor is the start of the new academic year, um, which is the main intake in um, February or March um, 2021 that allow time for um, hopefully international travel to be back to normal by then in Australia and the lower ever value of the Australian dollar since um, um, 2003 and also a recent IDP survey of um, nearly 700 international applicants for studying in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK and US also indicate a very high percent of this cohort, um, almost 70 percent with current offers expect to command their study at plant. And um, the government COVID Safe Australia indicate three steps, step one, step two, and step three, and in which international student travel is included in step three. So if the, restri uh, the restriction are easing quite effectively and the um, static a step three come quickly, so it's very likely that international student travel uh, may come back in, in July or August. Um, I also would like to um, mention a couple of circles that I think is quite important in looking at the recovery of international education. The first one is research and international education. So the latest figure from Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, released just around a week ago indicates that only half of the Australian um, 12 billion Australian university invested in research in 2018 was financed from funds resources that relied on international student fee. So there is a circle here where international student fee subsidize research and that affect research performance um, and research performance clearly impacts Australian university ranking and ranking in terms affects destination attraction and that destination attra attraction will determine international student recruitments. The second circle that I would like to highlight employability, post-study, work rights and international education. So why international student uh, contribute to Australian tax revenues, they are not entitled to subsidize government services. And this also means they, they bring net income to the Australian economy, but the job keeper subsidize it to support both employees and organization. And why excluding international students from um, job keeper subsidize? It also means penalizing employers and organizations that lawfully employ international students and that likely lead to employer hesitation to recruit international students and international graduates. And that may affect the employability. And it is critical in the context that international student employability and employment outcomes are increasingly used by university and government at destination attraction. I'm aware of the time, so I will move quickly to the last point that is the geopolitical tension and international education. So, um, we talk about the US, Australia, Canada, and China um, tension around issues related to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the independent investigation into the origin of COVID-19, so that is likely to impact on international education and international student mobility flow too. And another uh, phenomenon um, that is critical to regional student mobility in East Asia and, and Australia is South China Sea and the Naidash Line, the tension between Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, Vietnam, um, that group, and China 
with multiple reports on China's escalation in the South China, um, South China Sea um, amid COVID-19 in March and April 2020, and that clearly affect um, have the potential to affect regional student mobility. And some country in East Asia have effectively managed the pandemic while at the same time maintaining their political stability and improving their inter international standing. So a positive note is that that may create a favorable market condition for foreign investment and trade, and that may lead to economic growth and grow up new middle class family, and that again refuel the demand for higher education in, in a couple of years. So um, I'm aware of the time, so I would like to wrap up there with that um, positive note. Well, thank you thank very you. much, Lee. I mean, it's a great set of issues and the um, both the webinar and the chat will be available um, soon after the session is finished. So you'll be, be able to access that, that tremendous list of issues. Uh, on the geopolitical tensions, um, we do expect that we'll have a webinar around those issues, the effect of those tensions on, on higher education. But at this, this point, can I bring in, can I bring in Brendan Cantwell? Hello. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I've organized my remarks into two parts, which I can cover in 10 minutes. The first longer part considers the overall landscape of international education. Does the pandemic mark the end of mobility? The second shorter part considers mobility in the global research system, about which I offer some thoughts and concerns. International education reflects not just asymmetries of resources and academic capacity, as represented by push-pull models, but also the aspirations of individuals, cultural habits, and social expectations. People and community engage in international education to make connections and to have cult cross-cultural engagement, to make lives for themselves and to share in the creation and transmission of knowledge. There's also a political economy to international education that includes policy decisions, commercial markets, and macroeconomic conditions. To think about the post-pandemic future, of international education, we need to consider the context that has supported the system in the recent past. Over the previous two decades, international education has flourished. Significant events such as September 11th and America's ensuing global war on terror, the financial crisis, have not disrupted international education substantially, nor did the 2003 SARS outbreak. Since 2007, in the financial crisis, things have accelerated likely following a preset course and also fueled by privatization, neoliberal policymaking and institutional governance, which nurtured especially the commercial aspects of international education. Experiences of the recent past should give us reasonably strong priors that international education can overcome significant disruptions. But the COVID-19 pandemic is different and we need to interrogate our prior views. We often give a lot of attention to the large hosting countries, such as the USA, UK, Australia, and so on. But we also need to consider sending countries to understand how things could play. Using UNESCO data, between 2007 and 2017, the total number of outbound students increased by about 71.5%, from just over 3 million to, five, to over 5 million. The leading sending countries in 2017 were China and India. China sent nearly three times as many students abroad as India in 2017, and accounted for 17% of the total globally. Together, China and India accounted for almost one out of every four internationally mobile students. But other countries are growing fast in terms of the number of students they send. In 2007, about 27,500 Vietnamese students studied abroad, but by 2017, that number grew to over 94,000, a change of almost 250%. Central Asian countries, for example, also experienced rapid growth in outbound mobility. Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan all witnessed more than 500% growth in the 2007 base. And they all weren't, they all, they weren't all headed to major host countries. Among the 42,000 Azerbaijani students studying abroad in 2017, just over 1,000 of them studied in the USA and the UK while well, nearly 15,000 studied in Turkey, over 11,000 in Russia, and almost 9,000 in Ukraine. My point is that while the dynamics of international education are certainly substantially shaped by China and India, 
um, sending students to the USA, Australia, and the UK, and so, and so on. The global landscape also features considerable growth in regional circulation, as captured by the example of students from Azerbaijan. Let's also consider the US-China question. Political conditions seem unfavorable. A cold war between these countries is intensified in part because of Chinese politics and aggressive actions, but uh, a big part of it is also Trump's bellicose rhetoric and nativist administration, which includes relevant here, for example, higher student visa application denial rates. The pandemic has increased these tensions and also revealed China's superior ability to manage an epidemic. Because the ability to study abroad seems to be demanded by Chinese middle class, um, and that demand is placed on the, the ruling party, and U.S. universities will welcome the resumption of fee-paying student enrollments, the bulk of these disruptions could be somewhat short-lived, to the point of a vaccine, for example, um, as has happened in the past. On the other hand, the pandemic can, if the pandemic contributes to to increase tensions and hostility erupts, we could see a ban on mobility, which could be implemented by the Trump administration. Even if short-lived, such a ban would be highly disruptive. Just the suspension of the US optical practical training program, which seems rather likely to be honest, would be discouraging. Another possibility is that feelings that the US is unsafe because of not only because of long-term problems with gun violence, but because of the inability to manage the pandemic, along with the fallout and policy decisions made in the U.S. that could erode quality or increase the price to the point uh, of making a U.S. education out of reach and less attractive to Chinese students and families. If the China to U.S. part of the market faltered, other countries would try to step in. I'm sure Australia and the U.K. would be happy uh, to take many of the students from China who are currently going to the U.S. Um, but it's unclear if that would be enough for overall stability in the sort of short and medium run. Um, what happens with China in terms of outbound mobility will <clears throat> shape a big part of the overall picture, but I'm not sure that that will halt regional exchange. Regional mobility seem likely not to be disrupted in the long term by the pandemic, or seem less likely to be disrupted, I should say. In the short term, public health and macroeconomic conditions will matter a lot. Still, individual aspirations, cultural expectations, and the social conditions that allow many students to become mobile are, in my opinion, likely to endure. Even if the total number of international students grows more slowly, or even shrinks, and even if the commercial aspects of international education are weakened, I think it's unlikely that the pandemic will bring a wholesale end to international education. However, we may see a regional realignment. I want to address now the second part of my remarks, which focus on the research enterprise. The global science system and academic research enterprise are essentially, tri essentially trilateral. The United States, China, and, the, and Europe, um, which we'll call for convenience here the EU, are the three main centers of research. China is growing the fastest and is now the second largest spender on R&D, overtaking the EU aggregate. China produces the most papers, followed by the EU aggregate, and then the USA is third. Brexit, Brexit weakened the EU and re UK research positions, something I don't need to tell this audience. China surpassed the US in total publication outputs, and though China lags behind the US and EU in terms of top 1% papers, since 2010, there has been a noticeable increase in the influence of Chinese research. International education is central to academic science. European researchers collaborate extensively with other European researchers. While the US and China are, politically and e are political and economic rivals, these countries are in many ways scientific partners. Not to put too fine a point on it, but global academic science substantially revolves around the US-China axis. Inbound mobility of graduate students, postdocs, and academics from China to American research universities support the US research enterprise. Top Chinese universities are staffed extensively by academics who are trained in the US. Political rhetoric in the US makes it sound as if Chinese scholars are engaged in nefarious one-way technology transfer, stealing from America. Announcing a bill that would ban Chinese students from visa um, to study many STEM fields, Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn said, we're fed up, <clears throat> we fed Chinese innovation drought with American ingenuity and taxpayer dollars for too long. 
it's time to secure the U.S. research enterprise against the CCP's economic espionage. That view is, on the whole, both wrong and wrong-headed. Research by Jenny Lee and John Halp, for example, shows that collaboration with Chinese researchers um, and support from Chinese funding account for much of the growth in U.S. publication outputs. The USA is somewhat unusual among major international education hosting countries in that the number of postgraduate students is almost at parity with the number of undergraduate students. The large number of Chinese researchers and advanced students in the US are working with educational migrants from around the world, forming a fruitful hub. And the research enterprise is more tightly anchored in place than providing classroom education. Over time, research infrastructure can move, but laboratories cannot pick up overnight. Interruption of the US-China exchange in academic research from the pandemic will cause disruptions in the short and medium term. Still, the potential breakdown in research relations, the probability of which is dramatically increased by the pandemic, I think, is more dangerous. China may well be on a course to overtake the US's role in academic research, but the transition in research eminence takes longer than political and economic power. I mean, the UK, for example, still holds a a tremendous uh, uh, influence in the global science system, but it no longer has the political and economic power that it once had. The USA emerged as a world power after the second, after its civil war um, in the 1860s, but did not become a major economic research center until much later. Mobility and exchange between the US and China and Chinese students and researchers is central to the global research system. I feel that nationalist reactions to the pandemic included including nativist impulses in the US, threaten those ties that cannot easily be absorbed in other ways, as with other elements of international education. And that's where I'll end my remarks with this concern um, that yes, international education faces um, pretty serious challenges in the short run. I think that overall it will recover. I'm very concerned that the research system um, as organized right now um, could break down and I don't know what the consequences of that would be. I'll end my remarks now. Well, well, thanks very much, Brendan. It's very good that you brought the science issues forward because I agree with you. And I think they're, they're uh, longer and larger problems than the pandemic alone. Um, I've got um, a pretty impressive uh, list of potential questions here. What I'm going to do is, um, is take the first three questions, if we've got time for them all, from Rosemary Deem, uh, Kun Dai, and Olga Munn, because each of them can be can address their questions to particular presenters. So Rosemary, um, I'm going to ask you to come in now. So unmute and uh, put on your video and announce yourself and your question, please. And I think your questions belongs with Vivian Stern in the first That's instance. Right, yeah. Okay, so my name is Rosemary Deem. I'm from Royal Holloway, University of London in the UK. My question was about the situation of international student fees in the UK higher education system, because we've been charging those fees for a very, very long time, many, many decades, and the system has become dependent on them. And it's a very expensive system to run because it has so much residential accommodation, much of which will be left empty this autumn because I don't think there'll be enough people to fill it. And so the question is, how do we move away from the notion that international students brought money? Because if we're honest, a lot of UK universities didn't really support international students as well as they might have done in all kinds of ways, particularly in relation to language training. And if they're now in a situation where those students are thinking, do I really want to go there? And do I want to go to a country where A, I'm not sure if it's safe, and B, I'm probably going to be taught online and I'm not sure that the online teaching that I'm going to get is going to be as good as the face-to-face -face teaching. I'm going to lose out on the experience. So it, it raises a lot of questions about what, what the kind of strategy should be because I think that international students for a long time have just been the cash cows, and particularly schools of management especially, have been the cash cows of the higher education system in the UK. And now it's, that, that is really going to bite very, very hard. And I think the question is, where do those institutions go from there? Because all the evidence is that the less dependent on fees a higher education system is, the better it will weather this crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Can, Vivian, would you like to take that on? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the things that this, um, this crisis has sort of driven home is the extent to which um, the UK has been underinvesting in its research uh, performance. Because when you actually look at what will happen if we see a collapse in inbound mobility uh, to the UK, U UK universities aren't 
you know, they're, they're not profit distributing institutions. So the, the income that comes from uh, international student uh, tuition fees goes back into the operation of the university into teaching and research, generally speaking. And one of the things that became very quickly apparent when we started talking to government about, okay, what would happen as a consequence of COVID-19 is that it crystallized for a lot of people just how much the research effort could be damaged. And, um, you know, one of the conclusions that I would draw from that is that at a policy level in the UK, we do need to look at um, whether it is, you know, whether we have appropriately supported our research base. Um, because, um, you know, whether or not we find a return to the uh, old patterns of mobility, it seems to me for a country of our, um, of our type, you know, with the um, uh, challenges we have remaining economically uh, successful, that investment in research is exceptionally important and that we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be effectively um, reliant on uh, international fees to make sure that we can sustain the kind of research performance of the UK system. Um, I think that what will happen this academic year is you see UK universities offsetting high fees with um, an interesting range of financial incentives. I think you might also see the same in, in um, Australia and uh, US. Um, but and you will know um, from Royal Holloway that the range of tuition fees charged to international students varies by uh, programme. And overall, the disparity between domestic fees and international fees has reduced in, in, in um, recent years as we've increased uh, domestic fee levels. Um, there are some programmes which are highly competitive and, um, and also some very high cost subjects where the international fee is, um, is very significant. It will be interesting to see what happens both to demand and to the pricing strategy of institutions. I agree, I think it will be something that will be very interesting to watch. Thanks Vivian. Uh, we could discuss that topic of course for the rest of the time, but I think we'll bring in more questions and more, uh, and more issues. Kun Dai, uh, would you like to come in now and ask your question and introduce yourself, mute off and uh, video on. Thanks, Kun. Thanks, Professor. My name is Sin, give the opportunity to ask him questions. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, webinar to share different views. And uh, my question to Professor Tran is about the future of the international students' immig immigration opportunities in Australia and also their employment issues or their employment opportunities in Australia. As we know, many international students coming to Australia, they try to get permanent residency and then start their uh, working career here. But now, uh, what can happen in the future uh, after the, maybe the pandemic or recently uh, for the Australia context, how the policy could be changed in the future on the international student immigration and the possible the employment issues. Could you share about your thinking about this? Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Kundai. Um, that is a very important question. And unlike the US, there hasn't been any indication about um, the change in, in migration policy in relation to um, international students and international graduates on um, temporary graduate visa or, or post-study work visa stream, um, the 4A5 visa yet. Um, however, we are, we are not sure of the future because um, the, the, the nexus between international education and migration and, and policies around that nexus have changed quite frequently over the past decade in Australia. With regard to employment and employment opportunity, I think um, it is becoming more and more difficult in Australia as well as in um, other major destination country for Australia um, for, for international students. In in Australia, for for those who who are on the post study work visa and who haven't been able to find a job is becoming more difficult given the rising employment unemployment rate in 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 Australia and and for those who 
are working in the um, hospitality industry. Clearly, they um, that is the in industry that suffer major job losses. Um, mm -hmm. But if the pandemic is managed and effectively, as it is now in Australia, and the restriction are easing quickly, so there is a good opportunity that um, you know they 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 can be back to the workforce soon. Um, having said that. Yeah, depends on um, the the employer perspective to what international student and international graduate as well, because um, at the moment our research indicates that there is a lack of understanding from the employers to what international student who stay on in Australia on the post study work visa in order to look for job. So many employers have no idea about what that visa is, and they don't have the um, a sign of certainty or security in recruiting someone who is on a two years or three year post study work visa. And with the job keeper subsidy that uh, exclude international students, um, it make it more difficult as I mentioned in, in, in my presentation because it may put business at risk. They may feel a sign of being risked if they Im employ international students or employ um, international graduates because they are not entitled to job keeper subsidies. And mm -hmm. um, so that policy really disadvantage international student employment and employability in the um, short as well as long term. Mm, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, and, you. And thank you both. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, I'd now like to ask um, Olga Munn to ask uh, the next question. And I think this question is going to go to Brendan Cantwell. Olga. Uh, thank you uh, um, for the opportunity to ask a question. So my name is Olga. I'm a doctoral student at the Department of Education in Oxford. Um, and my question is, is quick, whether um, it's, a, it's a bit of a blue sky question, <laughs> whether uh, this crisis could be an opportunity to reimagine, uh, you know, international education in more ethical terms. And Brendan, you mentioned um, Central Asia. For example, I come from Kazakhstan and in Kazakhstan, it's one of the largest sending countries abroad. So the government pays for students to study in top universities. And there have been years with the, when the budget of uh, that program of international education was bigger than the whole education budget of the most populous regions in the country that actually uh, educates most of the people who will most likely stay in, in the country. So how is this, um, what's your vision? Is there a room, uh, at least maybe academically, to, to try to reimagine a different system? This is an, interest, this is an interesting question. I can't um, uh, 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 claim to uh, be a, uh, an absolute expert on um, uh, Central Asian uh, mobility schemes, I just, uh, you know, was commenting on this pattern of uh, regional mobility growing, growing quite, quite strongly, and it reminds me your comment of an observation I, I, I thought about a, a long time ago when thinking about the Mexican Conacyt um, uh, 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 postdoctoral scholar program, where they would pay people with PhDs um, to go to largely U.S. and Canadian universities and contribute to the research enterprise there on on the Mexican Treasury budget, right? And so, uh, yes, individuals benefited, but a big beneficiary was actually the universities that received these researchers coming to do research or research paid by by another country. And I think um, that this provides an opportunity for governments to reassess this sort of um, uh, center periphery mindset that has that has come to dominate thinking about international education and begin to think more about regional collaboration, um, developing regional capacity, um, investing in the ability for for, for regions to um, to host large research programs um, by uh, collaborating and exchanging with each other as well as through interactions with these major um, higher education hubs. And I, I think there's also another dimension to this is that we can, um, I, we'll never not need some kind of travel to have international education and to have these connections. But what this pandemic has shown us is that we can do more um, in terms of uh, virtual engagement, which has the, uh, the, the benefits of at least easing a little bit some of the, the carbon um, uh, uh, contributions of international education. 
Um, so, you, you know, not a complete answer, but just a, a, just a few thoughts. Thanks, Brendan. And um, I'd uh, at this point like to bring in Wen Wen from Tsinghua. Um, and I think Wen, you've got a question about the research system issues and that they may well end up with Brendan again. Okay. Wen. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning from Boston. Yeah, I'm in the United States currently. Uh, so I'm, I'm also uh, concerned about um, the um, the research collaboration uh, between China and the United States, because um, US is the biggest research partner of China. Um, the research collaboration between Chinese researchers and the US researchers, you know, uh, is the most compared to other, uh, you know, collaborations between China and other countries. So, but given the current antagonistic uh, relation between China and US, uh, just yesterday, um, there was a Secure Campus Act unveiled in the US and uh, uh, would pro um, prohibit Chinese nationals from receiving uh, visas uh, in the United States for graduate. I mean, in the, uh, in the STEM subjects, you know, also there are some, some uh, restrictions of the thousand talent you know, um, uh, program. So um, yeah, given all this complex situation, I would like to listen to your ideas about the future of research collaboration um, well, will the, will the international cooperation, research cooperation continue and in which fields do you think um, the international research uh, collaboration will continue because, yeah, things will get, will get worse and worse. <laughs> So I'll try to I'll try to be brief. We don't have much time. Um, this act, this bill introduced um, by Tom Cotton, uh, Marsha Blackburn, and others um, in the Senate is um, the bill's not mm -hmm. going anywhere. It's not going to probably make it out of the Senate, and it's uh, certainly not going to pass the House of Representatives. But it represents an important political movement inside mm -hmm. um, a big, uh, you know, you know, the Republican Party, the largely governing party in the United States, which is, which sees Chinese uh, scientific and economic uh, engagement as a, a, as a major threat rather than as a major asset. Um, I think that that's an absolutely um, uh, terrible approach that uh, the, the U.S. scientific scientific partnership is the greatest scientific partnership in the world and um, it produces a lot of uh, benefits for both countries and, you know, a lot of common goods. Um, I think that uh, in, the sh in the short and medium term, the political challenges are going to be great. We will probably... Um, we are likely to see in the run-up to the election some kind of executive orders that make things difficult for people. I think fields that will be targeted will be engineering fields, computer science fields, um, uh, 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 primarily but not exclusively. Um, but I think that the individual ties and the entanglement between these research systems is too extensive and um, uh, too deep that uh, to, to unravel it uh, quickly. Um, and so what really will matter is how long this political assault lasts. If it lasts another year, um, then uh, 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 at the same level of intensity, then, um, then we'll be able to survive it. If it, uh, if it lasts four more years, it will be a more <laughs> difficult situation. Well, thanks very much for the question and the answer. Um, at this point, I think we have to move to a close. I, I want to apologize to many uh, who've posed interesting questions. Hemlal uh, Batarai from Bhutan, Jian Yang Mai, uh, Conor O'Reilly, Sarah Lepura, Anna Kent and others would have, been, I'm sure, made a good contribution to, to our discussion. At this point, though, I'd like to ask our speakers to wrap up with a minute each and start, first of all, with Vivian. Well, thank you for that. And likewise, thank you for the comments in the chat. I think the thing is that um, there is a conversation starting now, um, which um, must encompass the questions that have been raised about the, uh, the model, which has been, uh, has predominated in, in uh, big receiving uh, countries such as the UK and the US, um, and the ethics of internationalization. There was a question which I particularly liked about um, the the sort of um, way that we we immediately jump to global mobility when we talk about internationalization and perhaps this period of us all sitting in our 
bedrooms and and well i'm sitting in my bedroom there you go that's letting you on a secret um uh, is an opportunity for us to to rethink um what is possible through internationalizing uh, the curriculum and the activities of universities without depending on um, those things which only a small proportion of the population is ever going to be able to take part in the kind of physical mobility between systems and um, I think there's there's got there's got to be a conversation about um, the ethics of internationalization and we haven't talked about sustainability but if it gives us one thing um, more than anything it's an opportunity for us to understand how you can successfully collaborate internationally without flying so much and I think and um, that really has to be part of what we use the next year to think about. I'm sorry that we haven't had a chance to debate more of this, but I, I'm really glad uh, Simon does these sorts of things all the time. So I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. Most certainly, Vivian. Thanks very much. Um, Lee. Hello, Lee Tran. While we're waiting for Lee, I might bring in Brendan for a, a one minute wrap up. Sure. I, um, I, I want to echo Vivian's um, uh, encouragement that the conversation continue and to also highlight um, what she noted in that there are many sort of tendrils to this, to this discussion. There are discussions about curricular change um, and how we can internationalize curricula um, w w without having uh, physical mobility. There are questions about the ethics of international education and the power dynamics. Um, embedded in them, uh, both uh, geopolitically and individually. Um, and there are qu questions about, uh, you know, scientific rivalries and great power competition. And all of this is sort of wrapped up in, in this very important topic. But uh, I want to end with a sort of note of optimism that I think probably everyone uh, on the screen has been touched uh, personally by international education in some way. And that this is something that brings people together that allows us to develop ourselves um, and uh, and to make the world a better place, and we should not give up on this as a as an important social project. Thanks very much, Brendan. Have we? Do we have Lee online? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Please sorry, come in. Sorry for that. That's okay. I yeah. Um, I'd like to wrap up with a note about international students. So during the pandemic. It is really important to highlight the hardship and difficulties that international students are facing and the support needed for them at different levels. However, the dominant discourse currently tend to position international students as being vulnerable and victims. But we should not forget international student transformative agency and their continuing contribution to communities around them in the face of adversity. So I think there is a need to highlight their contribution more and raise the awareness of the broader community and the public about their contribution and um, the benefits and as well as the agency. So I'd like to wrap up with um, International Student Transform Transformative Agency in the face of adversity. Thank you. That's completely right, Lee. Um, I want to thank our speakers for their wonderful contributions today. Um, thank Trevor at CG who makes it all happen. And thank you all for your participation, uh, your, your questions, your discussion. Um, I feel very positive about that, about that webinar. Um, it's very energizing to see the commitment, um, the goodwill, the, the momentum there is for international education, international cooperation, in science and, and higher education. We will certainly continue the conversation, all of us uh, that Vivian mentioned. I, let me get, go further and say, I think we will sustain, build, rebuild and further build international education in future. See you next week. Thank you. <laughs>